Welcome, everybody. This is a wonderful occasion. Hey, it's July 20th, 6 p.m., American Art Museum celebrating Nam June Pike's birthday. I mean, and I can't think of a better place to be doing it because the um, American Art Museum has really done a fantastic job in restoring and presenting and giving a major place uh, to this artist in our galleries. Across the way, the Megatron Matrix, one of his spectacular works from the mid-90s that really just transforms through a wall of movement uh, our whole thinking about the moving image. And that's really very much a part of what we're celebrating in this gallery, in this exhibition, and through this artist. Also, in the Lincoln Gallery, you can see uh, Superhighway uh, US Map, which uh, really became a um, really key work at the reopening of the uh, American Art Museum. Is it really, well, celebrates this country, which was so important uh, to uh, Nam June. Um, his whole life, with, with, uh, from his birthplace in Korea and this sort of extraordinary epic journey he made across Asia to Europe, Germany, through Europe to the United States, arriving in New York in 1964, where he was to really take on a spectacular role, both as an artist and as a visionary, as a thinker, all rolled into, into one. And we like to think of him as a really global artist, ahead of his time in terms of uh, his impact on contemporary art and the use and transformation of the moving image. And um, I have to say is that uh, the, the other thing that really makes this a, a very special place, the American Art Museum for Nam June Pike, is that it's now home to the archive, the Nam June Pike archive, which is really an unmatched resource on this artist and bringing together his papers and technologies. You can't imagine we shipped in I mean, I don't know how many truckloads of material, old radios, TVs, audio tape decks, uh, his papers, his writings, uh, works in progress, an enormous trove of materials that really give us extraordinary insight, and this is what archives can do, into the artist's uh, creative process. So it's going to be a place that will be a real resource to scholars, artists, uh, and uh, curators. And uh, I just suddenly, I don't think I introduced myself. Yeah, I, I, who's this guy up here talking away like this? Like, <laughs> what does he know? Well, anyway, um, my name is John Hanhart. I'm a senior curator here for Media Arts and uh, have had a, a long time uh, relationship support of uh, Nam June. We were uh, great friends and colleagues. I uh, presented him in his first big one artist show in New York at the Whitney Museum of American Art in 1982. And then later in the year 2000, uh, the, his, uh, the Worlds of Nam June Pike exhibition at the, uh, uh, at the Guggenheim Museum in the great Frank Lloyd Wright Rotunda. I have to tell you a story. Now, when I was working on that show, Nam June said, uh, well, I have this concept. Uh, I want to create, uh, and this is inside the Rotunda, this building, this great, vast space. And he said, I want to create a seven-story waterfall and then I want laser to move, bounce through it, up to the top. And I said, well, John, that sounds fantastic. I mean, and, uh, but how can we do it? Well, the exhibition crew was uh, extraordinary, and they constructed this seven-story waterfall, which in, it was a powerful way for Nam June to, ca to capture the idea of nature, energy, and the laser. Because the laser, as it moved through the water, would, would be captured as a beep beam of light, and it just transported you up and so that wherever you looked in the gallery surrounding the installation, it reminded you of this powerful force that communications, that new media are, in which he transformed virtually single-handedly into an artist's uh, medium. It's, and it's an extraordinary story. So I like to tell stories too a bit. I'm not a great storyteller, but I know a great storyteller in this room. His name is Ken Akuda. Now he's Nam June's uh, nephew and a great friend and a great supporter of Nam June. He's done so much on behalf of his legacy since Nam June passed away in 2006. 
and uh, instrumental behind the archive, uh, coming here and uh, a great friend of ours. And um, he's also a great storyteller and he's done a lot of things to me when I've tried to give lectures, like his uncle would interrupt me and do all kinds of things. Anyway, Ken, can I invite you up here to uh, share a story with us? Can you come up? <laughs> Thank you, John. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> once we were in New Hampshire, where, where McDowell Colony, art colony, right? Yeah. Not an ant colony, an art colony. Art colony. And um, where Namjoon was getting an award, this is when Namjoon was still around, and since Namjoon, you know, his health was not good, so I went there representing Namjoon as his nephew, I guess, you know? And, um, and so John would give the serious talk, and I would just tell a few funny stories, you know? And while John was talking, I, I was seated right over here, and a it was a kind of a fluxus thing. A mosquito landed right there, I could see. So while John Hanhart was talking, I got up and I slapped him, <laughs> you know? Hard. Very hard, because the mosquito was right there and I did Thank not. You, um, and if, you know, if you hit slap a mosquito lightly, they just run away, fly away. So, so we, we do things like that. You know? <laughs> But um, we, we're very lucky to have John here because he is the world's foremost authority on Nam Jun, of course, and then you've known him for so long, you know, so we're, we're lucky he's here. And we're, we're lucky here at Sam because we have the largest representation of these wonderful installations. And um, I have to say something about US Map, the wonderful vision, Nam Jun vision of the United States. Uh, the, you know, Sam and Betsy Brune here did, did such a wonderful visionary job of restoring the piece. The piece had been taken down, it was pretty much destroyed, and the piece had to be completely rebuilt uh, in 2003, I believe. And uh, without that, it'll just be uh, a pile of rubble in the archives, you know. So, so, the, so that, that wonderful piece is there for that reason. Um, you know, I have to get my mind together because I fell asleep about an hour ago and I just got up, so I'm not all together here. But I came to the US when I was 14 years old and, and I went to see Namjoon in New York and if you can believe it, you know, if, if you know Namjoon and this other group of wacky artist called Fluxus. And I came to New York when I was 14 and Namjoon was my guardian, you know? <laughs> it's really uh, quite a far-fetched thought. <laughs> and uh, so I spent my time hanging around all these uh, Fluxus artists, you know? I was gonna say wacko Fluxus artists, but I think they, they kind of were, you know? I don't know if you know these names, but there were, there were people like Joe Jones, Ray Johnson. Uh, hmm? Charlotte. Oh, of course. Charlotte Mormon, of course. Uh, I, I think of Charlotte as bigger than, bigger than Fluxus, you know, sort of. And um, Charlotte became my very good friend. I used to, I used to hang around, around, uh, around Ramjin and, uh, and Charlotte a lot. Uh, and I have to tell you this one funny story. Um, when Namjoon had a show in the late 60s at the Howard Wise Gallery on 57th Street in New York, uh, Charlotte, may, you know, she was playing this, <clears throat> this Namjoon piece called the TV Bra, you know? And uh, if some of you know, in the late, in 1969, I think, Charlotte Mormon and Namjoon had been arrested for having a, a topless cello performance in New York. And the, you know, a TV bra is, is, is a bra made of two little TV sets right here. 
and, and Charles Mormon, who was a Juilliard trained cellist, uh, uh, you know, who, who played for the American Symphony Orchestra under Leopold Stokowski, nonetheless. Um, she, you know, she was playing Namjoon's cello with the TV brawl, and every 20 minutes or so she would take a break. This is in the, in the, in, in the, at the Howard Wise Gallery. And she gave me the job of helping her remove the bra, you know. And I, I must have been, I, I, don't, I don't remember, I must have been 16 years old or something, you know. And Charlotte had really nice breasts, you know. And, and uh, she, she was Miss Homecoming Queen at the University of Arkansas in Little Rock. And uh, so when Namjoon found out that Charlotte had made me in charge of taking a bra off and back on, he threw a complete fit. I mean, you would not think he was a fluxus artist, you know, a cultural terrorist. All of a sudden, he became a guardian. <laughs> he and Charlotte had the biggest yelling match there, you know, about like, how can you let Ken, you know, take your bra on and off, you know? And, and they had the biggest yelling match there. And, uh, and in the end, Charlotte asked me if I minded doing it. I said, no, it's okay. So, 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 so that's how it was settled. And, and I, I don't think Namjoon Charlotte trusted Charlotte since that time. I don't know. But um, anyways, um, I'm, I'm talking too long. So um, <laughs> um, thank, you, thank you for coming for Namjoon's birthday. And, and he left us too young. He would be only 79, but I, as I was telling, uh, uh, Jim Campbell, yes. the artist earlier, uh, artists never went to the gym. That's why he's gone early. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. I mean, the, the, the stories, I mean, I, I remember when uh, we were presenting in, in 1982 in his retrospective, Charlotte uh, used my office as a dressing room to prepare for regular performances of the TV cello, which was uh, a cello made out of televisions that she would actually perform and play. And this extraordinary sound would come from it. And she said that it was the first advance in the cello since 1600. And, I, and all that's about Namjoon's, from the TV bra, the cello, it's about humanizing technology. It's about making it something other than this sort of abstract, a uh, foreign medium, something that could be remade and reshaped. And I think that's um, uh, very important. And I, um, you know, as, as Ken was talking and thinking about the archive, it's um, uh, organizing this material. I've been spending a lot of time with the staff here, great staff of the American Art Museum, going through these papers and objects and we're going to have an exhibition in December of next year in, this, in the gallery down the way that will feature a lot of the works that Ken was talking about. And that, so you'll have a real chance to see the archive alongside, uh, selections from the archive alongside some of his major artworks that are going to be, which we're gathering from around the world. So uh, it'll give us some, that much more insight. But what's come really reminds, I'm reminded of constantly as I've been uh, trying to, you know, finish my essay this summer you know, uh, for the catalog is the uh, range of uh, Namjoon's uh, accomplishment. I mean, he not only transformed video, this, this medium, but also the very idea of television and his creation of these sculptures, large-scale installations really created a path that, um, really, as I said, reimagined uh, this uh, medium. And uh, uh, all of his work uh, became an inspiration to artists when he was alive. He was very supportive of younger artists. And his legacy and ideas, his artwork, continues to inspire a new generation of artists working in our expanding, ever-expanding global, global media culture. And so this gallery is a very a wonderful site for this presentation, for this discussion and celebration of Namjoon entitled Watch This, which is what Namjoon would say, John, watch this. I'm just developing this thing. You've got to see it. And 
And that's what all these artists are doing. This is a connection between and across generations. Uh, in, in, in the galleries, this is a gallery devoted to work that's come into our permanent collection. So it's really signaling um, a major uh, commitment uh, to this medium and to the work of multiple generations of artists working with, these, with video and the moving image and all of its forms, analog and digital. And um, over there in the edge of, on the, 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 of the gallery is a videotape by Nam June from 1969 called Experiments with David Atwood. And I hope afterwards, if you haven't had a chance to see it, you'll take a look at it because it really shows an artist exploring a new dimension of moving image making. And I think it's um, creating a new visual language and exploring the very construction of the moving image. And I think it provides a new dimension and layering of the image, a new dimension of color and transformation. And as I mentioned, it's being shown here with the work of artists who've built on that legacy and have further transformed how we see the moving image. And they, in the process, occupy key places in today's art world. Bill Viola, Peter Campus, Corey Archangel, and of course, our very special guest, Jim Campbell, who is visiting us from uh, San Francisco. It's been really my privilege to know Jim for many years, uh, recently involved in the commissioning of a work that he did in Madison Square Park, a public artwork that um, was uh, just extraordinarily received. And uh, really, again, as I hope to say just in a few words, um, shows the range of his work. Jim studied engineering at MIT. And he has what I have to call a profound understanding of technology. And it's something that I've, I want to stress, and that is that he, the artist, isn't being led by the technology. He's leading the technology. He's transforming it. He's making it do something it hasn't done. And uh, this is the key, just like a painter works with uh, different uh, ways of fashioning a pigment and the surface and the canvas and building up the image. It's not just simply what a particular pigment is, it's what it can become through the hand of the artist, that imagination. And as I said, it's been my privilege to follow Jim's career for many years. And I remember from the late 80s and early 90s his uh, interactive pieces that uh, just uh, were really, uh, really caught my attention, blew me away, and, and, and a whole many of us curators around the country. And I remember uh, Jim, the uh, hallucination. Um, it was a piece that changed in time. If you can imagine this work, it um, is you when you walked into the gallery and saw yourself on the monitor screen, it captured your image, and then suddenly it burst into flame and disappeared. And so it was an active interaction uh, with the viewer and uh, really, in a sense, challenged and transformed how you see yourself in a space and through a medium. Uh, Jim's artwork stands out today for its inventiveness, sophistication, and as I say, transformation uh, of aesthetics because it's really changing how we describe art, how we see art, and giving new dimension of tonalities of color and surface and spatial depth. I mean, Jim will be talking about these pieces, but the very construction of that surface, the, uh, the manipulation of the uh, materials is um, coming from the artist. And he, because of his, as I said, his command of these materials, he's really fashioned something of, uh, extraordinary. Um, I revisit this gallery a lot. And um, I am always uh, you know, just I see like I'm seeing something new in his work each time I come in, and um, uh, we are proud to have Jim your work in our permanent collection, and uh, that you're part of the inauguration of this gallery devoted to the media arts that are, as I said, now part of our collection permanently on view, and I hope you all have a chance to keep visiting our gallery. So now I'm going to hand things over to Jim, Jim Campbell, to speak about his work about Nam June and continue our celebration. And Jim, where are you? There you are. Okay.
Thank you, John, for that introduction. And um, I want to say it's an honor to be here in this uh, wonderful museum. I'd actually never been here before, and it's a pretty amazing place. Um, I don't have that many Nam June Pike stories, but the ones that I do have were pretty, I would say, influential in my life. I'll keep this brief, because I know we're off for cake and ice cream, I think, after this. Um, but the um, probably the most important work of art that I saw in the 80s, that in the early 80s, that kind of, uh, I think, changed my path from thinking about myself as a filmmaker, which is what I started to do in graduate school, to starting to lean in other directions towards electronic art was um, seeing uh, the show that John did in 1982 at, at the Whitney. Um, at the time, I was in graduate school in uh, at MIT, filmmaking, and I drove down with a friend just to see this show of this artist that I knew very little about, Namjoon Paik at the time. I'd mostly known his single channel stuff. And the specifically, the he Namjoon Paik, I think, did a few works called TV Buddha um, that were in the show that John did, retrospective in 1982. And that work specifically really changed my life. It made me see television in a different way. It made me see video in a different way. It made me see time in a different way. And it's a very, very simple work. I'll describe it briefly, because I'm assuming some of you don't, don't know it. And John, if I get it wrong, please <laughs> break in and let me know. Um, it's very simple. It's a, a Buddha seated on a pedestal facing a camera and a monitor. And the camera is pointing at the Buddha, and the image of the Buddha is on the monitor. So essentially, you have the Buddha looking at an image of itself um, in a live way, even though the Buddha obviously is an inanimate object not changing over time. So the viewers kind of become part of the work as they walk around the installation. Um, and six years later, I started making uh, video art that incorporated cameras and the viewers and image processing, um, which I'll briefly talk about um, one, other, one other inspiration that I had never actually thought about before until I got this phone call to come and be, be part of this birthday party. I was an undergraduate at, at MIT in the mid-70s, mid to late 70s. And one of the things that was um, MIT was famous for at the time was it was the number one most neurotic place in the country to be, to go to school. Um, and so I looked for uh, other things at school other than my electrical engineering, and I found film and video. and. At the time in Boston, it became pretty clear that one of the things that people were very excited about was image processing, taking images and manipulating them through what were called synthesizers. And to the point of my, uh, when I graduated my undergraduate thesis project was I built, my, built and designed my own video image synthesizer. And I would say that um, and I called a couple friends about this who were there with me at the time and some teachers in the last couple of weeks. Um, Namjoon Paik's synthesizer, which was at WGBH in Boston, had a lot to do with the energy around the, the city at the universities with bringing kind of manipulation of video as, as an art form. And so those two things really, I would say, um, definitely inspired my path as an artist. Um, the two works here are from a series of works that I've been doing for the last 10 years that um, w when I started, I think in, when was it, uh, 2000, I was interested in creating works that existed right at the borderline of perceptibility with regard to resolution. This, th this work has, uh, I think, about 400 pixels and this work has closer to 2,000 pixels. And the, the kind of experiments in the beginning, at that point, a lot of research had already been done on low resolution still images, pixelated still images. There's a famous 
image uh, that was done at Bell Labs in the 1960s of Abraham Lincoln that probably many of you have seen that's kind of considered the first pixelated image. And a lot of research certainly has been done on, at that point on, on still images and perception. And I started thinking about um, what if we add movement to that? What, what can kind of be presented at very low resolution? And can there be any poetry left or is it just this cold kind of digital feel? And that was 11 years ago and that these two works kind of have come out of that process. Um, one of the things that I did from the very beginning when I started this series of works, they're essentially made up of LED panels with screens in front of them. In this case, the screen is a uh, two and a half inch thick piece of resin with embedded particles inside to kind of diffuse the light as the uh, LEDs go through the, uh, through the resin so that you can kind of see the, the image as it's being formed if you look at it from the side. The most boring uh, way to see this work is exactly the way you're all seeing it right now, which is from the front. It's really more about seeing it from the side. Um, and the work on the right, um, the circuit board is actually, the LEDs are tilted towards the front of the photograph, toward, towards the top of the photograph. And the closer the LEDs are to the, the pixels are to the photograph, the more you see the pixels, the more digitized the image is. So the moving image kind of goes uh, gradually from an analog representation on the bottom to a more discrete representation on the top. So people are actually walking back and forth kind of between these two representations, in a way, two different forms of um, abstractions. When I made these works uh, from the beginning, pretty much, my thought was to create a system that was incomplete. And the way to complete them would be with these kind of analog screens and the putting analog screens in the front of them. I made a work in um, 1997, 96, 97, that was called The End. And it, it's a very simple work. All you see is a single pixel kind of moving in the middle of a video screen. But what the work does is it generates all possible images. So any image that you can imagine, whether it's an image of your birth or an image of your death or an image from a Woody Allen movie, any image will eventually, sh all images will eventually show up on the screen just by using a digital algorithm to generate them. It's kind of like the monkeys typing Shakespeare, but the difference is that, um, or at least for me at the time, I had never thought about vision as being this uh, discrete thing like the alphabet is. Um, I certainly, coming from a film background, never thought about creating a film somehow that would generate all images. It's not something that one would think about. But once you shift from the analog domain to the digital domain, there are only a finite number of images possible. And that notion uh, really upset me. It made me not want to do digital work anymore. And that's what led to this series of works where the analog part of the works are essentially the screens that are added to the front of the, front of the panels. And I guess I'll end um, uh, talking once more about Namjoon Paik. I was trying to come up with a connection and inspiration for the last 10 years uh, relationship of these works to Namjoon Paik's work. So I always say Paik. I know I should say Pike, but. <laughs> um, and I looked at uh, some of his works. And in particular, I looked at a work called Magnet TV, which is a very early work where he essentially takes a magnet and puts it on top of the TV to distort the image that's being created by, um, by the rastering of the image. And um, the, what, it, what it was kind of fascinating, it, it kind of reminded me in a way of uh, thinking about other mediums, what some filmmakers did kind of around the same time where they would modify the projector or they would um, add sand into the, project the film as it was being projected or scratch the film itself. 
So in other words, um, ways of going outside of the limitation of the medium itself. But one of the things that the Magnet TV did, for example, is that you have this image on the screen, distorted image. To, old televisions worked with magnetics inside, so if you put a magnet on top of an old TV, it completely distorts the image. And um, one of the things that I thought was interesting about that work, um, separate from the fact that it was going outside of the medium of television and video itself, was that the, um, there's an image and then there's a distortion of the image by the magnet. So there's no separation between the um, image and the physicality of the presentation. It, it essentially turns it into a sculpture. Um, not because there's a magnet sitting on top, but because this image is being distorted by the physical um, presenter or the physical machine. So there's no separation of the image from the machine, it's just one. Kind of like, as I was saying, the filmmakers who would put sand in the, in the video projectors. So, th this whole, so for the last 10 years, I've essentially been making magnet TVs, where 10 years ago, I created these panels that were incomplete. And I'm leaving open the, the, the kind of screens to be created kind of through time. And uh, so the works don't exist. Uh, you know, I could ask you, what is the image of this work? And you can't answer it without, um, or you can't, it, it doesn't make sense to answer it without answering it in the context of the presentation through the unique screen. So that was kind of my um, escape from the analog, from the digital, digital world to the analog world. And um, I guess if there, is there a little time for questions maybe? There is. Yeah, okay. I just, of course, I want to say something. Okay. So um, first of all, I, uh, Jim, uh, you gave one of the best descriptions as you were talking about Magnet TV uh, about uh, Nam June's experiments with David Atwood because it, right. it, that is a piece that was actually done at WGBH in Boston. Mm -hmm. That's where it was produced in the studio. And it's that constant pressure on, uh, to make it something beyond between, the beyond the medium. And, and, and you feel that stretch of process and performance uh, in the work. So uh, the connections I hadn't even imagined between your work and Nam June's, and I think you very eloquently explored it and represented it. I just wanted to ask you also about this. It sort of raises the issue, uh, not to change it too much, but yep. the issue of so photography and this choice of this <laughs> object, you know, that sort of arrests the, the notion of stillness right. against this movement. And again, it's, it's another way of coming back to the issue that you just talked about. But perhaps you could just say something. Well, the, the image, I had obviously a number of photographs that I took that I could have used. And the image almost, there's something about the single newspaper wrapper there that gives it depth, that pulls you in, pulls you into the depth of the image. Otherwise, it would simply be a texture. It might not even look like a floor. Um, but one of the things that I was working with with this work is the floor actually is going off to infinity at the same time that the pixels are kind of coming forward. So it's the relationship of the floor to the pixels. And um, as you can see, you don't even really see the floor up here anymore because of the interference pattern of the pixels. They're almost the same size as the, the floor tiles. Well, we could have a couple of questions. Would anybody like to make a question or observation? Yeah, back there. How would you respond to someone who would say, you seem to be fighting technology and history and going away from digital to analog? And how much of a struggle is that, knowing everything that's happening these days with screens and technology and cameras? Well, it's, it's essentially a manifestation of my own internal struggles, being a, a nerdy kind of engineer, half of me and kind of finding ways to escape that. Um, it, it's, yeah, I, guess, I think that's the easiest way to answer it. One more, anybody? If there are no more questions, then you know what? We're going to birthday cake at the Luce Center. 
And where should they should walk? They can follow me into the Loose Center. We're okay. going to walk through the Hall of Wonders exhibition into the Loose Center to enjoy some birthday cake. And the panel has more story. <laughs> Thank you.